my name is Ilya. I'm working for Data Agrid. Um, my primary focus is actually PostgreSQL, but this talk would be not only about PostgreSQL, but about many databases and the interaction with a Linux operating system, because many things are quite common. I'm not sure if it's a good time to talk about Linux internals right after lunch, uh, but I try to be <laughs> not very boring, actually. So uh, I was actually at this conference last year, and I was giving a talk about uh, database uh, tuning from hardware to um, operating system and to the database itself. Uh, the problem with such talks is usually that uh, it's very difficult to pack everything in one talk. And it looks usually like some sort of checklist. So turn this syscatel parameter to that, and something like that. Uh, for many people, it's not easy to understand. And people come up and ask, OK, uh, why we should put these settings to this value, and so on. Uh, and I tried to extract some uh, most important from the database point of view thing, uh, actually, are your problems. And try to cover that not in the checklist style, but with some schemas and descriptions how it works. So uh, I will take actually some giveaways uh, which setting can be better for your database. But most likely this talk is not for give you advices to this syscatel parameter to that value, but to explain things in some details uh, and um, schemas and so on. So why uh, Linux uh, at all? Linux today is maybe the best platform to run your database. Uh, talking about Windows, probably it's not a good idea to run open source databases because most of open source databases rely hardly on a shared memory and there is no such concept like Unix style shared memory in Windows. That's why we have lots of performance problems with uh, open source databases on Windows. Um, as for FreeBSD, um, more or less it's uh, not keeping up with Linux in terms of many performance things. So uh, gradually, um, Linux became uh, the most advanced platform for databases. Uh, and actually, many database vendors, I mean commercial database vendors, they contribute to Linux a lot to improve uh, performance. So things like huge pages and so on, they mostly develop it using uh, efforts from large companies. Um, why IO? I already told that most likely IO can be a huge problem for DBAs because you know the disk is slow, memory is fast, but still IO is very difficult thing for most of DBAs. Another important thing is that actually there is lack of information like that for uh, operations engineers for DBAs. Most of information uh, is spread evenly among many mailing lists of kernel developers, uh, some articles on LWN, and uh, those information is made by kernel developers, and that's why for the kernel developers. Most likely it's quite boring to collect different information from different sources, so I try to summarize that for you. So the main IO problem for databases is uh, how to maximize throughput between memory and disks for the pages. So most databases using the page concept, which is quite convenient because it's easy to schedule transactional protocols, transactional algorithms like uh, two-phase locking and VCC and so on on the page model. That's why we need to maximize throughput of those fixed size chunks from disk to the memory. So the IO problems are not only the problems with disks, but also the problems with memory and actually not only with memory. Pretty much every tier of operating system and hardware is invo involved with uh, IO performance problems. Uh, that's a disk, memory, CPU, uh, all the layers of IO subsystem like virtual file system and so on. 
file system and the database itself. So pretty much uh, each tier should be covered in this talk in some way with some ideas how it works and how we can tune that. Uh, so not only problem is the disks. That's some typical databases. Uh, really simplified picture. Uh, it depends which type of database. It can be more or less complex. But the idea is simple. We have uh, some data files on disk. Uh, and we read those pages to some shared memory structure uh, if we want to read information from our database system. And if we need to change something in our database system, we uh, change practically entire page. Uh, and this page became duty, like uh, database people usually say. Then we have some amount of duty pages in shared memory. We need to flush them back to the data file. It's uh, not very useful to try to write them immediately because we need to find out where to put them and this is not about performance. So basically we have inconsistent uh, shared memory uh, and uh, some data file and from time to time we need to flush pages to the disk. Also we have write ahead log. A write ahead log it's quite an old protocol uh, which allows you to maintain the consistency actually and to recover fast. So when we change the database page to the data state, we write information through the wall buffer to write ahead log about this change, which allows us to recovery and um, at the same time we can write write ahead log faster because it's sequential. But that's actually quite simple. Uh, if you take a look on this uh, part, uh, it's a page cache. Uh, so most likely this database is Postgres because it's the only database which use uh, buffered IO only. For MySQL you can run that uh, like this or with direct IO so the page can be synchronized uh, without page cache in Linux kernel or through the page cache in Linux kernel. Uh, such double buffering is probably a downside, but um, it's slightly easier to implement and historically many databases were using this way of input-output. Uh, so uh, what is, are key things about such workload? Uh, first of all, today shared memory segment can be very large. And that will generate lots of I.O. if we try to read pages, write pages, and so on. Today, then I start, started to talk about uh, Linux and databases. I, I used to say, if you have eight gigabytes of memory, that means you have a good server, and so on and so on. Today, half a terabyte of memory is a database server. So uh, this amount of shared memory can be very uh, large, and that will be difficult to put it through uh, the operating system tiers to the disks. Uh, so uh, even if you just read the pages, you need to put them inside those shared buffers so a significant amount will pass through from the disks to the memory. Uh, there can be problems with write, and write ahead log because many databases can generate lots of file and you need to write write ahead log fast. But again, the key feature is that pretty much the, all the tiers are involved. So people do a very common mistake uh, trying to use uh, an expensive server as a database server uh, like with a huge amount of CPU cores with lots of memory but with SATA disks. Uh, and in that case the bottleneck will be SATA disk because it, do it doesn't matter how many uh, memory do you have on the machine. If you have SATA disk, that will be a single bottleneck and it will take forever for you to populate uh, all those uh, pages to the memory through such a bottleneck. Uh, let's start with uh, memory because memory is path of IO in the terms. Uh, how quite simplified memory allocation works uh, in Linux and how that can affect uh, our database. First of all, that's a really simplified schema because uh, if we take a look on modern Intel, uh, the schema of the caches, how many caches and how they work will be much more difficult. But for us, it's much 
more important than just the principle. So if uh, CPU needs some memory to operate with, uh, it can access that in very close small caches or uh, in different logic caches. Uh, that's made for um, efficiency. Uh, but the main idea is that CPU uses so-called virtual addresses because it's quite much easier for software developers to develop programs uh, using concept of virtual memory which is infinite and uh, which is obviously not true in real world. So at some point we need to translate the request for page from virtual addressing to physical addressing. Uh, we have a special unit uh, which calls memory manage management unit uh, which responsible for this operation. Uh, and this operation on a huge amount of memory can have uh, a huge impact on performance uh, besides of many other things. So um, to spare on this translation operation, uh, man man management unit uh, has a special structure called TLB, or a translation lookaside buffer. So basically, uh, if CPU needs uh, a page which should be allocated, not already allocated, which can be retrieved from page table, it actually um, caches the operation of translation. So we have basically a cache of uh, those operations to get the pages fast. And like any cache, uh, it has problems if it becomes large. So if we have huge amount of memory on our database machine, uh, the problem is that in spite of TLB uh, has upper limit and will not grow uh, indefinitely, it can be very large and it can face uh, all the problems of large cache, like uh, cache misses, uh, like you put the page in the cache and never use it, and besides of that, it has a huge overhead in memory. So uh, it's not very efficient to uh, chunk the memory in the default uh, pages like uh, for kilobytes, uh, for kilobytes because um, if you have a uh, lot of memory on the database machine, most likely you will want to have it like a large chunk of shared buffers, and it's much better to uh, chunk it in larger pieces. So the concept of um, huge pages was developed uh, for the databases, and most likely if you have database server with enough memory, you want to have uh, huge pages enabled. Uh, because your TLB will work much more efficient. Uh, and uh, to do that, you need to enable them in the kernel, and most of current uh, modern databases can use them if you enable them. But there is another problem. Usually, if you read some blog post or something like that about uh, huge pages, you can find out that there are some good uh, modern huge pages and old uh, bad huge pages. Usually people talking about more progressive, better huge pages uh, refer to so-called transparent huge pages. But most likely for your database, transparent huge pages would be not a benefit uh, or, so to say, quite opposite. Because um, transparent huge pages is a good concept. The idea is you should not uh, just define the amount of huge pages at the start but you have some clever mechanism to shrink them, merge them, and so on. But database uh, usually allocates memory like a huge chunk of shared memory. And those uh, uh, permutations of memory like merging, uh, sorting, shrinking uh, pages, it's not a good idea for the database. Database cannot cope with that, and uh, if uh, under the shared buffers, uh, there is some merging of uh, huge pages, uh, database simply uh, will wait forever and uh, the best idea with databases is actually to disable transparent huge pages and to use uh, old school uh, normal huge pages to allocate memory at once then you start the database. Um, another thing with uh, memory is how uh, Linux can allocate and free memory. And this 
thing has a huge impact on uh, database behavior. I will uh, discuss that in uh, actually several stages. Uh, first, I will describe how it works on the schema. Then uh, I will say how you can re regulate that. And then we shall see how your database can be affected by those uh, things. So basically, uh, in Linux, we have a special structure uh, we call free list in the kernel. It's a list of pre-allocated pages which can be fast allocated for our application. Uh, this is also simplified picture because normally we have many of these lists for different NUMA nodes and so on and so on, but that's not uh, the case for today's talk. Uh, so if our application, our database for example, uh, needs a page, uh, we allocate it using alloc from the head of the list and then our database no longer needs this page, we can return the page to the head of the list uh, because our application deallocated that. So uh, the list can grow from the head and uh, can uh, decrease in size from the head. Uh, usually our database has a huge uh, shared buffer segment and, and this segment is already allocated so uh, lots of our memory is uh, in no use for uh, free list. Uh, but uh, database need also so-called process memory like uh, we refer that in Oracle uh, or in MySQL, probably most likely it also the process memory. Uh, in Postgres we call that work memory. So we need to allocate memory to make sorts, uh, joins, and so on and so on. Uh, so this memory need to be allocated and reallocated and this is important not to run out of the memory and allocate the allocated efficiently. So it's the first mechanism. So we can free memory, allocate memory, and free list grows or shrinks here. Uh, but another mechanism is actually a so-called page outing. Uh, if you remember, in old Linux kernels, there was a thing we call flushd or pdflush or pdflush, uh, different types of uh, flushing of pages. Uh, in computer science, we will say page out daemon and now in modern kernels uh, we call it uh, flush threads because it's multi-threaded and works with different free lists. Uh, so the idea of page out daemon is that we have a uh, page cache and it's like pretty much like in database. If some pages are no longer in use they uh, sync in the page cache because of last recently used algorithm and then they reach the bottom, page out them and can uh, actually page out them, put it to the tail of free list, uh, and those pages are not destroyed. That's basically the page from the page cache, which, was, uh, w which is not deallocated, just put it here. If uh, right after it was put it in the free list, uh, we again in our database need the page, it can be reclaimed also by uh, page out daemon and put it back uh, to page cache until it will uh, sync again. So that's the second mechanism. So if we run out of memory, we can take some pages and put them back to free list if we do not uh, need them anymore. Uh, the third mechanism of uh, how to get free memory is to swap it. Uh, in Linux, uh, swapping is slightly different process uh, in comparison to uh, old Unixes like System 5 uh, like systems. Uh, in those times, swapping uh, was about to swap entire process uh, to the disk. Today, uh, swapping is it's actually something like page out. In some cases, we can take some pages from page cache and put them to the swap. Uh, that's some emergency measure to, uh, to not run out of memory. Uh, so how it works in general. Uh, if we allocate in memory, our free list is shrinking. Uh, and if page out daemon cannot uh, put some extra pages to the tail of free list, we can hit this uh, setting VM mean free kilobytes the minimum size of uh, free list. And uh, if we hit that, uh, Linux need to uh, deallocate some memory 
to make it free for further allocation. And in some cases, it can swap several pages to swap to make some free pages. In some cases, uh, it intensify the page outing. And if nothing helps, uh, the special process calls OM killer comes and kills some process on your database server. So uh, how it works uh, with uh, exact settings and with exact priorities. Uh, so page outing happens if someone call fsync. For example, if your database issues a checkpoint, most likely uh, there will be fsync and the synchronizing of dirty pages. Uh, so if you have some pages, they will be deallocated and you get another memory. Or uh, timeout exceeded or too many dirty pages. There are uh, four settings actually, VM dirty background ratio, VM dirty ratio, and complementary settings in bytes, in exact amount of bytes. Then we have in page cache uh, VM dirty background ratio, by default it's 10, that means 10% of all available uh, memory on the machine. Uh, the page out daemon will uh, try to page out in background mode, so not very intensive. Then it reach dirty ratio, by default it's 20%. It starts to uh, intensively page out. If nothing helps, uh, most likely operating system will be using swapping or call OM killer or whatever. Uh, it's important to uh, know that it's reasonable to tune uh, dirty ratio or dirty parameters uh, to uh, to be like uh, your cache size on the RAID controller with better backed cache. But f for modern SSDs, uh, most likely you can leave the default parameters, they uh, will work well. Uh, the clue is that uh, if uh, nothing happens with uh, page outing uh, up until 10% of uh, memory is duted on the machine, uh, and if you have a uh, RAID controller with better backed cache, with cache size like one gigabyte, most likely then page outing will start. Uh, your RAID controller will not afford all those crazy amount of writes because 10%, it's, it can be much more than one gigabyte. Uh, with uh, modern multi-channel parallel uh, SSDs like NVMe, for example, uh, that doesn't actually uh, play any role because your disk most likely will afford all this right. Uh, another important thing which regulate how it works is how the swap actually behaves. There are several settings for swap. First of all is overcommit memory, and for databases you probably want do not overcommit it at all. So basically you have virtual memory and your Linux can treat it as uh, just memory or memory plus swap uh, or some, uh, something in between based on some heuristics. Uh, so the idea for databases do not overcommit because if you overcommit you will use swap a lot and that will be slow, too slow for a database. Uh, another thing which is important and uh, that's a good example to show how complex things are in Linux kernel, is uh, mean free kilobytes. If you remember this schema, we can regulate uh, what we uh, actually suppose uh, for a free list is too small. Uh, for a database, uh, normally it's a good idea to keep free list not very small, because if you need to sort uh, something in your SQL query or perform hash join or something like that, you need lots of pages to, to be allocated fast. So from one side, uh, you do not want to call OM killer and uh, you do not uh, uh, want to run out of memory. From the other side, the free list uh, should have some reasonable size. So it should not be very small because it will slow down your sorting or hash joins and so, something like that. Uh, so idea is to set that like uh, this size, it will be definitely less than 10% of memory available for your machine for uh, database servers from 64 gigs to 128 gigs. This size will be quite reasonable because most likely if you want a larger sort, um, 
page allocation speed plays no role in that case because uh, just to uh, put all the pages uh, uh, which you need to to use for hash join will be uh, much more overhead than allocating pages from free list. And another setting which is also very important is VM swappiness, which actually regulates uh, some ratio in um, what amount of cases operating system will try to use swap. So basically the idea is if uh, you're running out of memory and your page out daemon works not very efficient, operating system can decide uh, if uh, operating system will intensify page outing or immediately go to swap. And if you have a default 60, that means most likely then in 60%, that's not so strict, but most likely that's a heuristic thing, uh, most likely it will go to swap instead of intensifying page out process. And that will be quite slow for your database. So basically uh, another bad thing is to disable swap at all because if it is disabled and page on daemon cannot work very efficient, uh, OEM killer will uh, kill some process on your database server. If you have a database server, you can imagine which process it can be most likely. And that's not the thing you want. Uh, previously, uh, you can read that in many blogs or something like that, uh, email lists, uh, the general recommendation was to switch swap uh, entirely, so put that to zero. This is, from my point of view, a slightly bad idea because uh, that maximizes the probability that uh, OM killer will kill your database. So uh, you need to have some uh, uh, usage of swap uh, allowed uh, in case of emergency. Do not switch it off entirely. Uh, so basically, the one is good settings for database to uh, avoid OM killing at the, in the case that you run out of memory. Uh, but still, uh, you will need not to use swap too often. Uh, as about OM killer, actually, um, OM killer is a bad thing and a good thing because um, I know many DBAs who hate OM killer because it can kill uh, the database, but uh, this mechanism is some sort of safety measure. Because, um, good question, if we can switch uh, OM killer entirely and would be happy about that. Uh, if you take a look on the settings which effectively switch OM killer off, you can probably guess that uh, it's a bad idea too, because if uh, we switch uh, OM killer off. Uh, that means if we run out of memory, uh, it will cause kernel panic, uh, which is better for your database uh, to be killed by OM killer or to um, to die just because of kernel panic. I don't know. Actually, both things are quite bad. So better not run uh, run out of memory and not to try to switch OM killer. It will not solve your problem. There are several ideas how to uh, actually say to a um, killer to work with lower priority or to set the priority for a certain process like database. That actually doesn't work if you take a look on the OM killer uh, code in Linux kernel. So basically uh, it will check those priorities right after it will kill Postgres or MySQL or something like that because generally uh, the function which uh, is executing to kill uh, something in case you run out of memory. Uh, it just checks the process uh, uh, which has lots of siblings. Uh, it checks the process which uh, consumes lots of memory and then take a look on the priorities. So most likely at first two stages your database server will be killed because it runs like multiple process. Uh, those are siblings of one single process and it consumes lots of memory. So basically the recipe with uh, loving the priority is not entirely a good idea. Uh, another problem is file system. We are going down uh, through the stack. And modern file systems has a very useful feature we call that uh, journal. Uh, but problem is uh, if we have large kernel buffer and we write 
data through this coronal buffer. Uh, that should be uh, a case then you have lots of information in uh, data, for example, but lacking of journal information for that data because the journal entry is quite above in the large kernel buffer. And this is a bad idea for a uh, journal-weighted file system because e the file system would not recover in case of uh, some problems will happen because we have data, but we have no journal for this data. Just imagine r dirty pages without wall. Uh, that means you'll lose them. Uh, for that purpose, Linux has special system call uh, which calls GDBD barrier, and uh, then we have situation like that. Kernel just issues this system call, and that effectively stops uh, further dumping of the data to the disk up until kernel will resort the kernel buffer to put the journal data. And in that case, even if you have a uh, very fast disk subsystem, uh, that will mean uh, uh, performance degrade in 10 times, 100 times, uh, that will be really slow because constant resorting of kernel buffer of size uh, 32, 64 gigabits, that will be very slow. So uh, file system barrier is not a good idea for database, especially if you use um, modern uh, SSDs with uh, cache and uh, capacitor, uh, which allows you to drop the uh, data in cache to persistent storage. Or if you use RAID controller with the battery, which uh, also performs like uh, SSD with uh, capacitor, that, uh, that is a better mechanism to keep your data safe uh, in comparison to uh, file system journal. So if you uh, use proper hardware like normal SSDs with uh, server grade, uh, with uh, capacitor and cache, or if you use um, BBU on RAID controller, uh, you should remount uh, your file system without barrier because that would be only a performance problem. Uh, another thing to take in mind that if we're talking about performance and modern databases, most likely we want to use X4 or XFS. There are plenty of benchmarks uh, which show quite clear that um, if we're talking about performance, those two are the champions and things like BetterFS or ZFS, uh, they are not good about performance. They only bring convenience and this convenience like uh, you can uh, resize uh, volumes on flight and so on, uh, that has uh, some price. And this price uh, is all about performance, so better run on Linux, your database on X4 or on XFS. Then we go uh, to the entire um, IO stack. And pretty much on every uh, layer of IO stack, we can run into problems. So we need to figure out how it works. If we have a database memory, it depends on the database. We can use direct IO or we can use page cache. But finally, uh, those things will go through file system. Uh, we can use Oracle uh, automatic storage management, which will go directly, but most likely it's not our case if we are using some open source database. Uh, those uh, IO requests will go to block IO layer in the kernel. So basically, uh, Linux collects uh, some pages, just like a database. Uh, put them to some IO vectors and transfer them to request wire to put them forward deep to disks to disk driver and so far. Uh, at this stage, it's a smart idea to uh, improve the efficiency of IO operations because, you know, the database, you have pages pretty much from every part of uh, your data file you need to do that more efficient. Uh, historically, in Linux for many years was invented the special mechanism for that, which is called IO scheduler or elevator. So it's the mechanism 
which allows us to uh, take these requests and uh, perform some magic with them to make the I.O. more efficient. Uh, before kernel 2.6, there was so-called Linus elevator. Uh, and it was a very simple uh, sort of file scatterer, uh, which was only one available in times of uh, 2.4. Uh, basically, the idea was we have many pages in each vector, and we can uh, merge and split and sort the pages uh, to make the I request more efficient, because uh, our operating system can know that those pages are from one sector of the disk, and it can do that more efficient. That's the same basically problem like uh, it's convenient to use SQL to retrieve data, but it's more convenient to uh, keep the data uh, in memory like a pages, because uh, for human, SQL is much more convenient, but for transactional protocols, pages are more convenient. The same thing with disks and memory. In memory, it's much easier to uh, operate with pages because uh, transaction algorithms, but disks still uh, operating with some cylinders. And that was quite obvious for magnetic disks, but today it's still uh, true in many ways because uh, in spite of modern SSDs are not uh, magnetical disks with cylinders, but all those uh, infrastructure is written initially for magnetic disks. So SG driver still operates uh, with cylinders, sectors, or whatever you call them. Uh, so we need some sort of elevator to perform some more efficient write request. Uh, and this elevator had lots of problems, like, for example, starvation. Then you write something intensively, reads uh, working not well because uh, these schedules are only designed to uh, improve one thing, like reads or writes, and most likely writes. Uh, and it was very piece, a very old piece of uh, Linux code, uh, not improving for many years. This uh, nice article is actually not about IO scheduler. It's, this article is about CPU scheduler. But it covers lots of things like uh, uh, quotes from Linus, like our scheduler is the best piece of uh, Linux kernel because it's all the oldest one. And that's why that, is, that, that means that it's perfect. Uh, not so true, actually. And this uh, paper covers a lot about that. Because in times of single CPU with magnetic disks, it was working well. Today, when we have big data, databases, uh, large amounts of memory, and CPUs, that doesn't work at all. Uh, then, uh, just in 2.6, uh, there was introduced CFQ, uh, complete fair queuing. Uh, do not. Uh, mix that with CPU scheduler. Uh, it's just the same name, but well, actually different name. Uh, it's universal one, which was uh, based on some priorities. So some processes can have queue for merging and sorting. But basically, it's the same scheduler. So more uh, prioritized, more convenient, more clever way to uh, merge and sort uh, I requests. And that's probably not a good idea for databases because, you know, um, database, uh, it's a single process. So uh, this scheduler is good for a desktop environment. Then you want to listen to music, encode video, and something like that at the same time. But for database, then most of I.O. is generated by single process or uh, siblings of the same uh, process. That's a bad idea. But still, uh, you can use that if you're working with a uh, rotating disk. It more or less work well. Uh, but database on rotating disks, that's not the thing uh, I would say uh, well working. <laughs> uh, then emerged deadline, uh, scheduler which, were, uh, which was slightly better for rotating disks. Uh, but basically, that was the same thing like um, merge and sorting and so on. Uh, and how good was uh, this approach to elevators uh, clearly shows that uh, by the end of uh, 2.6, in early third versions, uh, emerged so-called noob or none uh, scheduler, which basically uh, just disables all those wise 
merging and sorting uh, and leave it like, like it is. And for uh, disk arrays or PCA Express SSDs, uh, those types of schedulers show that they work much better. But still there were some problems because uh, in spite of uh, we uh, got rid of uh, unnecessary sorting and merging, uh, we still had the problems that uh, parallelism, which is essential for such types of storages, uh, was not uh, working well with uh, those type of scheduling because, you know, it basically uh, still thought that we have one CPU. That's why in uh, 3.13 uh, was merged so-called bulk MQ scheduler, which is actually not just an elevator. Uh, on this picture, uh, I just draw the elevator like some kernel stuff uh, to make request layer better. But actually, uh, bulk MQ is the replacement for wall request layer because it was impossible just to put it as, uh, into the same place like uh, to share the same IP like uh, normal scheduler. So basically, all those part of stack was rewrite uh, to make bulk MQ scheduler work in. Uh, it's much better in terms of parallelism for uh, normal SSDs. Basically, it can have a queue for each CPU for different numazons and so on. And even if right now, because you know there are lots, lots of work ahead to make uh, bulk MQ more efficient to uh, support its features inside SG driver in for the disks. Uh, now it actually can be a benefit for your database if you run uh, it on Linux, on SSDs. So from time to time we uh, have uh, lots of uh, write improvements as well as uh, normal reads at the same time using uh, those uh, type of schedulers. Uh, do not confuse yourself uh, if you take a look on NVMe drive uh, and you can try to check which type of scheduler it has, most likely bulk MQ will be referred like none or NOP, if for example you use Ubuntu LTS. But it's actually bulk MQ most likely. Um, so uh, that's it. I'm really thankful for my colleagues Alexey Lusovsky and Max Baguk for a lot of research on the topic, which helped me to summarize that for you. And if you have some questions, you feel free to ask that. We have several minutes, I would, I would hope, and uh, if after you have some questions, just email me. I try to answer. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So a question was um, that I told that X4 and XFS are the best systems for traditional databases from point of view of DBA, and the question was if it's applicable to NoSQL. Uh, from my point of view, if your NoSQL database uses file system extensively, not all of them using file system uh, constantly because they are in memory and need file systems only on the start, where you use it read only. But if you use file system extensively, most likely that's true too, because those file systems are besides of many things optimized for right performance. Uh, besides of that, for example, uh, you have so-called reserved space, which allows you to log in if you run out of disk space, which is much more convenient than you run on ZFS. Uh, but yeah, in terms of performance, definitely it works for no SQL as well. More questions? Uh, it's, uh, it's quite similar. So if you run something on XFS, don't run to change to X4. I, I personally think that X4 uh, can be better in several years because it's under intensive development, but that's it. <laughs> now it's pretty much the same. So if no questions, then thank you for attending. <laughs>